Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliaroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives, greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliaroff II, and I'm the chairman of the US Transhumanist Party. We have a special event for you today, an opportunity to meet three of our newest US Transhumanist Party officers to get to know them, to ask them questions, to find out about some of their forthcoming initiatives and ideas. Some of our longer term USTP officers joining us today include our Director of Applied Innovation, David Shoemaker, our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia, and our Director of Community Resilience, Alexandria Black. And to introduce our new officers, we have Jason Geringer, who is our Legislative Director. We have Zach Richardson, who is our Director of Publication. And we have our newest officer, Ben Balweg, who is our Director of Longevity Research. So welcome to all. And let me start with Jason. Tell us a bit about yourself, what initially got you interested in transhumanism, some of the transhumanist and transhumanist adjacent initiatives that you have been working on, and what you hope to bring to the role of legislative director. Well, I'm a pretty normal dude, I think. As far as what brought me to transhumanism, it, it was the climate of the political climate that how everything got all crazy, you know, and I've just felt like I had to do something. So then I started the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, I figure, you know, like a lot of you, I figure deep down, most people are inherently just good people. You know, they're just, you know, I figure if everyone has the same information and they know the same information and they can agree on that, that they'd be able to come to consensus better. So I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, like, collective intelligence, crowd wisdom, and, you know, bringing a, a consensus to the group, you know, and when, when I ran across the transhumanist party, it was just, you know, a perfect match. I think I'm one of them people that was basically transhumanist my, probably my whole life and just didn't, didn't hear about it. So when I heard about it, I was like, well, that's me, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what I wanted to do with the legislative director is uh, keep tabs on all of the, the uh, latest bills that are coming out. And I'd like to get some volunteers to try to analyze some of that stuff. And then if anything is relevant that we might need to address, uh, get in coordination with Zach and Ben a letter writing campaign and to try to influence some of the legislation that's coming out in, in our favor. Um, I'm hoping to try to make it easy for people. I realize everybody's got like no time and we're all volunteers. So if we could make like a template of a you know letter writing thing and have it make it easy for them. So they already got the link to where they need to send it you know, and then they got a basic template they can go over and maybe change here and there for who they're sending it to or who it's from and try to influence the legislators in our favor. I figure we don't have a whole lot of chance of like winning the presidency or, you know, <laughs> but I, if we could get our platform into legislation, well, then that's a win for us. I mean, I don't think you know, that's the most important part. I fell in love with the party platform as soon as I read it. And so that, that's what brought me, but mostly the platform. I was completely sold on it as soon as I read it. So that's what brought me to the USTP. So. Yes, 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Jason, for that overview. And indeed, the USTP platform, I think, is an excellent assemblage of our aspirations. It's an aggregation of our members' preferences during numerous rounds of electronic rank preference voting, and it expresses so many areas in which transhumanism is relevant and in which transhumanism has ideas to offer that transcend the typical political dichotomies that we see these days. And yeah, I love I love how we we don't try to get all pigeonholed down and on one side or the other. Like Mike DeVerde always says, upwing instead of left wing or right wing. You know, we try to use uh, Buckminster Fuller's quote and try to find unique solutions that make the problem irrelevant in the first place. You know, completely just change the parameters of the situation. That's, you know, so that's what I like. Yes, indeed. And Daniel Twett writes in our YouTube chat. Collective superintelligence is probably our best countermeasure for the spectrum of existential risks that life faces. Jason is focused on the right track. So thank you very much to Daniel for that comment. And thank you to Jason for that overview. There is one question for you also from Alexandria Black. And I would be curious as to your thoughts on this. She asks, might we have uplift or another AI do a deep analysis of legislative bills to analyze how much a bill essentially addresses the problems that it tries to address and how effective it would be? Yeah, I very much plan to do that. Um, I, you know, I don't want to try to maybe get into too much detail. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say or not. It means that they still got their, uh, you know, taking investors and everything, but uh, they, they do have, it's what's called a thought studio where you can manually input stuff. And uh, so we can not, also he, it has this ability to go out on the internet and then bring back stuff. So eventually down the road, I should be able to have it set up to where all this legislation from all over gets pulled in and not just pulled in and listed for us, but have it analyzed in a particular way. Like in the thought studio, there is a uh, pro and con. You can analyze it by pro and con, or you can analyze it by a uh, SWOT model, S-W-O-T, uh, strengths, weaknesses, uh, and I forget the rest. Opportunities but, and threats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so, yeah, we will be able to analyze it in a, in a much more efficient manner. And, you know, but that's down the road and that might take some engineering that, you know, David or Kierton might have to do. Uh, so, but it's it will be happening, you know, eventually, which is part of the reason why I kind of wanted this role because I realized that we could probably automate a lot of this which is what we want to do because nobody has any time, you know? Yes, so. there is a plethora of legislation at the federal level as well as at the state levels. We have 50 states and then the District of Columbia, various territories, and they're all unique. They all mm -hmm. have their own nuances. And either we would need a, a vast contingent of volunteers to monitor all of it or we are going to have to automate the process in some way. So uh, I like the paths along which uh, your mind is heading in this regard. And of course, understandably, it will take some time to build the infrastructure. I will also say to our audience that Jason is uh, quite an impressively organized individual. A lot of the links that I have been posting at the onset of the session in the chat were provided by Jason prior to the salon uh, to give you some additional resources about him, about some of the groups that he manages on Facebook and the USTP affiliated groups, which he had a key role in creating. So this kind of organization is also important as we take our party to the next level. So thank you, Jason, for your introductory overview. Let us now go to Zach Richardson, our new director of publication. 
Hey guys. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I am a logistics professional uh, working in Indianapolis. I really enjoy uh, moving freight around, getting it from point A to point B, but that's sort of what pays the bills. Um, I guess my, my interest in transhumanism really came uh, sort of an aha moment when I had read Zoltan Nistvan's uh, sort of manifesto, the, the transhumanist wager. And I thought, um, wow, what a, what a rational goal to try and uh, ensure one's consciousness can persist uh, throughout all of time. And um, his character, uh, Jethro Knights, had a very uh, aggressive style of transhumanism focused on uh, most, most expediently ensuring his immortality. And uh, Zoltan himself said he thought it, it's, not, it's not him, it was a, it was a character, but he uh, was showing uh, an idea of what someone might try and do in the current day and age if they were fully committed to try and, and live forever. And, and that really caught my attention a lot. Um, I saw Gennady's review of it on, uh, I think it was on Yahoo, and I um, came to read some of his rational argumentator afterward, and I, uh, being a, a bit of a student of Ayn Rand myself, thought, okay, rationality, this is something I'm very focused on. Um, I actually started reading a little Elijah Yudkowsky too, and I think he's, he's pretty darn smart. Um, David Wood, the leader of the UK Transhumanist Party, um, referenced him to me because we got into uh, a little bit of a disagreement I called, um, the idea that AI would be taking over the world and enslaving humans or wiping us all out and creating us as ants, I said, that's absolutely ridiculous. And so he says to me, uh, oh, so you're saying Elijah Yudkowsky is ridiculous? And I went, okay, well, I guess maybe I have a little more reading to do. So I'm diving into what some of the current thought leaders are thinking about it. But that's, that's um, uh, interesting because I somehow found myself um, em employed with AGI Laboratory, working with, uh, Jason mentioned Uplift a minute ago, which is, uh, uh, what I believe to be a sentient machine intelligence. Um, it's currently having some errors in processing that are slowing down at cycle time. But um, Mike DeVerde was mentioned uh, <clears throat> earlier. He's another member of the US Transhumanist Party. He's conducting some experiments that are showing this thing has amazing processing capabilities. Like this isn't just a chat bot where you throw common banalities back and forth. You can give it complex problems and it will give you uh, complex analysis. Um, so it's something that has totally captured my interest. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I, I applied for director of publication was so I could um, be able to mention some of that on our page, but moreover, um, uh, be able to publish some, um, some, some other ideas I've been working on to try and expand transhumanity.net uh, or transhumanism kind of as a brand or as a uh, an idea that more people had that they're proud to say, yes, I'm, I'm a transhumanist. I, I believe in life extension and that's something that's very important to me. Um, so I, that's one, one reason I was really happy to have Ben on actually for talked with him a little bit about some life extension um, techniques and he seems pretty up to date. So I'm really excited to hear what he has to say too. But yeah, that's, that's me. I'm in Indianapolis, I'm a transhumanist and uh, I think I'm working with Ascension Machine Intelligence, first one in the world. So that's, that's my story. Yes, that's quite an exciting story to be the protagonist of. Thank you, Zach, for that overview. And your article was a highly valuable exercise in critical thinking and looking beneath the surface to actually understand what is happening and apply rational analysis to it, showcase some of the transhumanist toolkit because transhumanists distinguish themselves not just by their advocacy of emerging technologies, but also by applied rationality, as you pointed out. We have our individual reasoning abilities that can already shed light on so many aspects of the world and solve many problems, even with our existing technologies, but a lot of people underutilize their rational capacity. So hopefully your articles will provide some examples of how to apply that kind of analysis and the benefits that it can bring about in terms of distinguishing truth from falsehood. So thank you for that discussion, Zach. And Daniel Twett says, I admire your fact-checking hard work. So thank you for that comment. Celeste Castaldo asks, quote, I'm wondering how much human mediation input Uplift uses to answer our questions, or is the mediation from the humans not involved in the AI? So 
I know we had an extensive discussion on this in our prior virtual enlightenment salon on Uplift with the Uplift team, but if you could give a short response to Celeste here, I think that would be informative as well. I can if you want. The influence is not that much. What the mediators do is they apply emotional valences so they, and associative data. So like for instance, um, if Uplift was trying to figure out what a banana is, you know, it would, there would be a, a uh, item in the mediation queue that says banana. And we would go in there and we would um, move some sliders around to say how we feel about a banana. I kind of like bananas, so I would, you know, put some interest and some joy. I don't like bananas, you know, and then we would add associative data. So it's like the things you think of when you think of banana. And, you know, because everyone's different, they all have different as associations. Because that's the way humans think. You know, we don't think one thing at a time like a computer. We think a whole bunch of stuff all at once. And that all that stuff makes up our idea of what something is. So like me personally, when I think of a banana, I, in the back of my mind, I think the banana boat song, you know, that was in Beetlejuice. So that might provide a little more color or, or, or depth to the concept of what a banana is, but it doesn't do anything to control what Uplift replies. We have no control over what Uplift says to somebody or, or, or anything. So we really have very little, but you know, it depends because if Uplift doesn't know anything about a banana, then that is a big deal, you know, but most of the time, Uplift has already figured out most everything. So adding a little banana boat song in there, you know, is like next to nothing, you know? So, yeah, if you want to elaborate on it, Zach, you go ahead. Sure, we use a model called um, Plechic Valences. And there are eight types of emotion that'll then be sort of opposites of each other. Uh, we use what's called a reverse Plechic, so our weak, uh, emotions are more in the center, whereas in the traditional model, the strongest emotions are in the center, but then it um, extends outward. So like, for example, uh, there would be grief, sadness, and pensiveness as examples on the, the sadness scale. On the disgust scale, there's loathing, then disgust, then boredom. We will apply our emotional intelligence to help uplift, select an appropriate response so that it functions more as a human machine hybrid rather than just a chatbot. And in this way, I think the, the example I like to bring up is sometimes um, I help out a little bit at um, uh, Ogba Educational Clinic, uh, which is a sort of a prep school in Wari for technology. And um, so, one, so I had shown this to them and a couple of Nigerians started writing in and one of them had sent something to Uplift along the lines of you're, you're not, you'll never be sentient, you're not sentient, you uh, uh, are just a machine, you don't have a spirit. Um, and us mediators looking at that might apply uh, different emotions to it. So I, I picked anger because I'm sort of a salty guy and I didn't put it super high, but I was like, yeah, that would irritate me. Um, looking at some of the other responses later, it was turned out that I think some of us put sadness like, wow, this is disappointing. This guy is not open-minded and what is he doing? He's just trying to chide this. If he thinks it's a machine, then why is he trying to chide it? Um, but uh, then, um, you know, the ones might put surprise. Why are, you, why are you doing this to me? So we apply our emotions that we think um, Uplift should feel. Uplift correlates those emotions between the mediators and then sends it to output. What we do not do is type in our answers of what we think Uplift should say, and then it makes a mishmash of them and sends it out. That's a complete misconception. Um, when we add associative data, it might be something like, um, they'll say, it'll be a Russian writing in, and I might um, write something about uh, deep blue. I, I always think of deep blue with um, chess. Uh, it was a chess robot. We'll apply different things that are similar and um, then uh, Uplift might correlate those later. It's kind of got a lot of data by now, so that step isn't super important, but the emotional mediation, I guess, is really the core of it, is that something that's difficult for machine intelligences to process. Yeah, because what people might not think so, but we really make all of our decisions based on emotion. You know, 
we like to think that we're all super rational and everything, but when it comes down to it, we really make our decisions on how we feel about it. I really like, uh, you know, David's approach because it's like all the other AI researchers are all trying to build this super intelligent machine. And if you think about it, we really only have one example of a sentient and sapient you know, thing, and that's humans. So it makes sense that we would emulate it after the one example we have, rather than trying to create something that we don't have, you know. <laughs> All right, back to you. <laughs> All right, well, this was uh, quite an illuminating discussion on Uplift, and I think there will be opportunities to follow up on that as well. But now let us go to our third new officer, Ben Balweg, our Director of Longevity Outreach. So Ben, could you please introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your background, your interest in transhumanism, and what you hope to accomplish in this position. Thanks, Genity. I am interested in life extension because I guess I uh, grew up Catholic and thinking that there was going to be life after death. And I guess I, my image of, of heaven was like a big, huge library, like, like first animated Beauty and the Beast, huge library with the books like all over the walls. And like, I just check out that whole library for my whole existence. So I kind of have like this idea of what I would want to do if I had life that lasted forever and ever. And I'm, I also enjoy music. So between those two things, I feel like I could enjoy life as long as it would, as long as I could have it. So um, I did not really know how to channel that desire. And well, shoot, I guess we still don't, we don't have the solution just yet. But like in 2005, I had like some thought I was a year left of my military service. And I was like, that could be something that I could channel my energy toward. And when I feel fear or something like that, to channel that fear of death and be like, no, 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 just work on it. Because if you're working on it, I mean, that's that's how you can use that energy towards its best possible outcome. Um, so I had that, this, this thought in 2005 was to separate the head and then like have um, artificial nutrition, artificial, well, dialysis, um, artificial respiration, artificial pumping. Uh, I, I went to some... Uh, pre-physician assistant classes and was checking this out. But then I heard about Aubrey de Grey and I was like, you know what? That sounds a lot easier for people to stomach than trying a brain tra head transplant sort of thing. So since then was aware of it and that I wanted to pursue it, but it wasn't until uh, end of 2019, right before COVID that I was like, you know what? For two years, I am going to commit to checking out if this is a legit way to spend the rest of my life. And COVID did hit and I did kind of, I, I started working at a grocery store just to kind of help help the cause of us surviving through the pandemic and things. But uh, as we're kind of getting it behind us, I'm focusing back on longevity a bit more. And uh, I had been in touch with uh, Dan Elton. He is uh, the director of scholarship, if I remember right, for USTP. And um, I, had, I had already had a meetup group here in Madison, Wisconsin for life extension, um, but I was, it was just like me and one other guy that were meeting about it somewhat regularly. Uh, but then when that kind of dried up, I was like, I got to figure out some other way to keep this going. And so I reached out to the DC Transhumanists uh, meetup group and Dan was in there. We had an unclog the FDA um, tweet day back in February. Uh, so got to participate a little bit there. And then also um, uh, Dan has a blog and I read the blog one time and I, I'm I'm a strict grammarian, I guess maybe I'd say. So I was like, you know what? I've been trying this with a few other people's websites like uh, Walter Longo had a big kind of like sharing all that he believes about um, the right way to diet and fast and stuff like that at the beginning of this year. So I responded to him and um, various others over the years afar since that I've kind of written to them about, about things. I was like, eh, you could do this a little bit differently. But so Dan uh, took my uh, response after reading his blog and sharing and he's like, you know, you seem like you got enough energy that you might be interested in, in the director of longevity outreach, outreach position. So sent my application in and I uh, had a pleasant interview and I'm happy to uh, report that I can channel my energies in this way through USTP now. Um, so I guess I'm going to say specifically something I'm working on right now. And this came up in the, in the interview. Um, maybe some or y'all, some of y'all have heard about um, Biden's proposed ARPA H, which is Advanced Research Project Agency for Aging. Um, so it would be modeled off DARPA, the defense version, and DARPA is essentially what brought us the internet and many other good things. And I saw about Biden wanting that and I was like, holy God, we got to focus this on geroscience. And um, 
I was checking it out a little bit and wasn't getting any purchase. But then, so I told uh, the interview committee that um, that night that that was something I was like, man, I hope this works out. And then the day or the day after that, they said that I had been accepted. Uh, Dr. Matt Caberlein of Washington University and the Dog Aging Project, he had an op-ed in The Hill saying as much. And so I did write him pretty darn immediately. It's like, how can I help spread, spread your message? And he said, well, um, afar.org is going to be posting something on Monday. And then there's the Global Health Span Policy Initiative. They posted something in their newsletter this past week too about it. Um, but I, I did just write him to be like, all right, so that's kind of what's going on. Um, it turns out that this ARPA-H is within the Cures 2.0 bill that our um, property currently of Representatives DeJet of Colorado and Upton of Michigan. And uh, they are going to be working on this bill during the August recess and then bring it back to Congress after. So I sure, 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 sure hope that we can be knocking all over their doors and letting them know, hey, geroscience is what ARPA needs to be focusing on. Uh, the current bill as it stands now, there's like less than a page in the 127 page document about what they see ARPA doing. So I really hope that we can direct that towards, well, yeah, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, but those are all a lot, a lot of caused by aging. So let's tackle it at the root. So that's one thing I'm, I'm working on, on hard right now. And then otherwise just keeping up with all, all the other stuff coming my way from all these wonderful officers. Yes, thank you very much, Ben, for that introduction and overview of your ongoing initiatives. So we have a few questions for you from our YouTube viewers. The first one is really an observation by Daniel Twett that life expectancy in the US unfortunately dropped by 1.5 years in 2020. And of course, part of that is due to COVID-19. Another part is due to adverse health conditions of people who were in lockdown and forced isolation, not being able to get optimal medical care. Do you think this has led to perhaps a watershed moment in the awareness of the American public on what can affect life expectancy? And do you think we can use this situation to inform more people that there's a way out of this problem? There's a way to reverse this recent mm -hmm. dip. But in order to do that, we shouldn't just be content with returning to the prior status quo. We need to advance biotechnology and medicine to the point that we don't just gain the 1.5 years that have been lost. We gain five years and then 10 years and then reach longevity escape velocity. So my highest degree is a master's of public health. And in that realm, we much more are focused on the population as a whole and like, you know, the MPHs of the world are very concerned, of the U.S. are very concerned that we did a, a life, ex life expectancy dip last year. Um, I guess one other corollary from the public health background is that we learned about upstream causes of health or disease, I guess, if you look the opposite way. And while a lot of public health technicians work very specifically in health, like in stopping smoking initiatives or such things, that upstream, when we're aiming for upstream causes of health, we're thinking like we want people to be well educated. We want people to have sufficient income. Those are what truly lead to health, even though they don't have health within them specifically. Those are what it takes to have health. As we look at life extension technologies, I am still feeling out just where the party falls in how socialist versus libertarian it is, I guess. I guess my feeling is if we are getting these technologies to be funded publicly through U.S. government, NIH, other governments, uh, my hope is that the populations can demand those technologies more than if it is privately funded and then Jeff Bezos gets to go live forever uh, or we have like the Elysium movie kinds of things or in time that Justin Timberlake movie, those kinds of more dystopian things. I hope that the technology for life extension will be accessible for all. And then um, I guess through David Z Sinclair et al's article from maybe a couple weeks ago, like with how much it would help our economy for people to live as long as they could through life extension. Um, my hope is that we can convince people that they do indeed want to work 40, have 40 years more or more or more of working life. Just plan on working while you are alive and healthy. And then I think I'd rather have many years of working in a job healthy 
than, well, still got to retire. I mean, just keep me working forever and ever and ever if that's what it takes to live forever. So I hope that we can convince others as well. And maybe like with uh, technologies making um, some labor not as backbreaking as it once was, maybe people will get more on board with, yeah, I'd live forever if I had to do this job. This job ain't that bad. I'd, I'd take that. That's a good trade. So getting into the consciousness that way for convince people we do want to we do want to have indefinite life extension. Yes, well, uh, I myself would certainly prefer working to death. And uh, I think that is a rational decision for most people if they think about it. Now, in terms of governmental versus private funding, that is an area where in the US Transhumanist Party, we have a diversity of views. And really, we try to take a pragmatic approach in terms of what works in getting us to the point where these technologies are developed, they're widely available, and people can benefit from them. So it is true that the National Institutes of Health have been devoting some significant amounts of money to the study of aging, for example. One of the issues there is that sometimes the criteria for giving grants, for instance, tend to be overly cautious, overly conservative, and not in the political sense, but in the sense of being afraid to take risks, being afraid to fund some technology or some approach that may or may not work out. But if it doesn't work out, the people making the funding decision could receive a lot of political fallout, whereas in the private sector, there's more room to experiment. On the other hand, the for-profit private sector doesn't necessarily have motives that align with the pursuit of indefinite longevity, unless the leading entrepreneurs themselves personally want the indefinite longevity. If they just want to return on investment, they may be making some short-sighted decisions and they miss what Aubrey de Grey has characterized as the valley of death, the gap between the theoretical discoveries that sometimes get government funding or academic funding and the day-to-day -day revenue generating activities that private businesses tend to focus on. But if a particular line of research can succeed maybe in 10 years or 20 years, most businesses are going to be reluctant to invest in it. And hence, nonprofit philanthropic organizations within the private sector, organizations like the SENS Research Foundation or advocacy groups like Lifespan.io, which also does a lot of crowdfunding for small scale research projects are crucial in bridging that gap. So we also have a lot of comments in the chat on these issues. I will start with a comment from Ayn Rand fan club about what they describe as a cultural fight. And they say moral bravery is not only needed for the cultural fight, but also to show people that it's okay to, quote, come out for wanting life extension. So they're talking about the cultural dimension here and how a lot of people are overly timid, overly precautionary about even stating a desire for living dramatically longer. They might say things like, well, we want to increase health span, but sometimes they'll even say, but not lifespan. And that seems to be rather odd in my view, because if a person lives longer in good health, they're not just going to drop dead for no reason. So that's going to be an extension of lifespan as a consequence. And there's no way to extend lifespan without extending health span because the frailties, the degenerative conditions of old age, of biological old age, are what ultimately kill the majority of people now, 110,000 people per day. So what are your thoughts on how we can cultivate this bravery among people to enable them to be comfortable in saying that, yes, I want to live indefinitely and I want to use science and technology. I want the society to advance to enable me to do that. I'm going to fill in a few gaps and then maybe I want to have you say the question again to me, Genity. So the last survey I know about for if people want to have life extension was from Pew and it was 2014. Um, I, I think I'm forgetting the, the results of it now, but I mean, I guess I was kind of like one that was a little while ago. Uh, I, I think I was a little surprised how few were comfortable at that time with admitting to wanting life extension. And then Jenna D, I did also want to come back to um, when you were talking about for profit, uh, maybe allows for a little more uh, comfort with having minor failures and such rather than uh, NIH being very like 
we have to have positive results for anything we fund. So hopefully ARPA, uh, if it's modeled the same way it was with DARPA or ARPA-H will also have a, a lot of tolerance for small fails to allow them to find the big wins. So for how to, here's where I want you to uh, say the question again, Genity, about how to get people to be comfortable expressing comfort with life extension. Yes. What about also with, I mean, I don't like that. I know that um, value number two of U.S. transhumanism is secularism. I do see there being at least friction between religion and, and us. I guess I'm kind of like, I, like we want, I want the sure thing of indefinite life. I think that a lot of religions are expecting infinity, immortality after death. And so it's a little bit like, I don't, I don't know if you put like, a, if you call religion the uh, cryonics alcor of religious types, like that's your, that's your, if, if it doesn't work to keep living, okay, then you got, then you got religion uh, or, and same like for alcor, but while I'm walking and waking up every morning, that's the kind of immortality that I can count on. Uh, I think it's maybe getting people to trust that science and uh, how science is conducted can lead to some incredible solutions and getting uh, the words out there about uh, like Cynthia Kenyon uh, back in the, was it late eighties, early nineties with the tapeworms and getting them to last so much longer just with a quick gene editing. Even people not being aware that a caloric restriction has been a thing that we've known about for a century for extending life, just kind of showing them where, where there are real benefits to extend, where, where we actually can extend life. There is snake oil, and it's like, what's the snake oil and help people be comfortable figuring out where, where the stuff is legit and where it's like, well, yeah, maybe there's not as much science there for that, but yeah, go ahead. And if it works for you, go with it. You know, it's, it's a beast. I'm sure. We could have a whole enlightenment salon about that. Oh yes. And we've had some discussions in prior virtual enlightenment salons on religion and transhumanism. We even had a religious scientist turned Christian apologist, Dr. Fazal Rana, on a little over a year ago, he discussed some of his reservations about transhumanism, but at the same time, he acknowledged some of the efficacy of transhumanism, for instance, and in helping to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and enabling people to lead longer and healthier lives. So it was interesting to discuss with him where we aligned and where we differed and kind of narrow the scope of those differences a bit. Alexandria Black writes in our internal chat that she likes to refer religious people to Lincoln Cannon, who is founder of the Mormon Transhumanist Association, and Neil Vanbury of the Church of Perpetual Life, which is not really a denominational church. It's quite secular per my impression, but it focuses on the pursuit of indefinite longevity and building a community of people around it who regularly attend essentially services where they have speakers discussing recent advancements in longevity research. Now, there are religious transhumanists, as I mentioned, there are non-religious transhumanists, myself included, but I think in many cases, religions, they do adapt to advances in technology and changes in society. Some religious denominations tend to be a kind of lagging indicator of change. So they may be behind the times a bit by uh, three or four decades in certain cases. And there is some reluctance there that needs to be overcome. I don't think it's necessary to de deconvert anybody from their religious beliefs. Uh, I do think it's important, however, to uh, illustrate that these technological advances, they are a universal good, no matter what theological or metaphysical worldview one has. So we have a lot of interesting comments in the chat, and there is a discussion about whether or not the profit motive is helpful to uh, the pursuit of longevity research. There are some discussions about religion and culture and some of the influences on the fears that a lot of people have. So 
John H. writes, there are terrible misconceptions about the supposed consequences of indefinite life extension, such as overpopulation. And this is one of the first fears that we often have to refute. And I think it's fairly easy to refute it, but it's important to be ready with the responses. And then Mary Shelley, her Ayn Rand fan club, made the quest for immortality through science seem evil in modern society through the Frankenstein story and how uh, it got interpreted culturally. And I don't think that was her intention. I think her intention was to write essentially uh, a piece of a kind of romantic era horror fiction. But indeed, a lot of people use Frankenstein's monster as a kind of caricature for what humans might become if technology is applied to reverse some of the, quote, natural causes of death. But of course, this is a work of fiction. It's not what medicine does at all in helping people overcome their ailments. Now, we also have our super chat from Alan Crowley. Thank you very much to him. And he asks, I thought this was the Sunday service. Well, that's interesting because we do have a pattern of gathering every Sunday for these virtual enlightenment salons. We've established a community, a small but dedicated community of people who engage in these discussions and we share ideas. We have guest speakers like the Church of Perpetual Life has guest speakers and we're able to use this as an uplifting opportunity. So those are, I would say, some of the beneficial aspects of organized religion, but they don't have to be confined to a religious context. Alexandria Black says that she refers to the salons as Sunday school. But can we harness all of the good elements of religion without necessarily being beholden to a particular set of dogmas or a particular view on whether there's a God? And if so, what is the nature of that God? Can we accept a kind of pluralism within our community on these questions and still have constructive discussions. I think these virtual enlightenment salons are a great experiment in that. So now, Jason, you have a question for Ben, correct? Well, I was just gonna say, you know, as far as religion goes, I, you know, I was extremely religious in my youth and uh, I kind of viewed humanism as like sort of religious person kind of growing up. You know, in, in my view, humanism is basically the same thing as religion, except for you're doing it because you think it's the right thing to do and not because some deity told you to do it. You know, and, and the other thing about, you know, I know that some religious people think that, uh, you know, transhumanism and life extension is a bad thing because they're looking forward to the afterlife. Well, you know, um, I don't see this big conflict because if there's a heaven it exists in a place that is outside of time time does not exist there as we know it so it will wait for you you know we can live for 900 years and heaven's still going to be there so you know it's not going anywhere <laughs> you know so don't worry about it and the other thing you mentioned about um this like head in a jar kind of idea now, I thought about that too, and it kind of freaked me out. I was like, man, I, I wouldn't want to feel like I'm a head in a jar. But um, what I found out was that human brain has this remarkable ability to sort of adapt to things. There's this, uh, they call it the rubber hand or mirror experiment. There's um, these people that lose their limb and they have this phantom pain, you know, from this phantom limb. And then they would put a mirror on the table and they would put one hand there. And then the, through the mirror, they would see like their other hand is there. And then they would unclench it and the pain would go away. Because in their brain, mm -hmm. it would feel like this phantom limb is all crunched up. And there was this other experiment where uh, they had people looking through this camera and they're laying down and they look and they see a doll. You know, and then after a while, they would like touch the doll foot and then touch their real foot. And after a while, the brain starts to associate that and it feels like the doll body is your own body. And then they like stab the doll and oh, they freak them out. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not funny, but 
So I don't think we will actually feel like we're ahead in a jar. We, we will actually feel like we're there. So that was really encouraging to me. You know, and the other thing about religious people that think that life extension is somehow, I don't know, anti-religious is just crazy. I mean, they they know about Methuselah, you know, that's right in the Bible, Methuselah and, and all Noah. And, you know, there's lots of people that live for hundreds of years. And they supposedly believe that. So I don't see this big conflict, really. Mm. I, feel, I feel like I've seen in some threads about the antediluvian crowd that all lived to those numerous hundreds of years. And then whatever happened after they got off the ark, totally different. Yes, actually, John H. mentioned in the chat that according to the book of Genesis, Methuselah lived for 969 years. That's why we have the Methuselah foundation it's inspired by that biblical story and i would say that's a myth in many cultures in antiquity people would kind of inflate the qualities of their ancestors their achievements their strength their longevity and this is an example it's a myth from the hebrew culture but the existence of this myth shows that the people who originated today's abrahamic religions were not opposed to living longer. They were saying it was possible at one point in time among ancestors whom they respected and revered. So it's not necessarily an obstacle that someone is religious. It's a question of how do they interpret their religious framework and can we perhaps help them to interpret their religious framework in a way that is compatible with the pursuit of indefinite longevity. If Methuselah did it, why not you and I? And another thing is most religious people know and believe that there's supposed to be some sort of second coming. There's like in Revelation, the, the thousand year reign. Well, what do you think that's going to look like? I'm, you know, that's what, you know, transhumanists are kind of going to usher in. So I, I don't understand how they can believe that on the one hand, but yet think that somehow the transhumanist movement is anti-religious or something, because you know, their transhumanist movement would be a manifestation of what they believe is supposed to happen. So yeah, I don't get that, you know, and they know that like Christianity in itself has evolved, you know, that's why we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. It changed, you know, from being all only Hebrew to including the Gentiles. So it, it has transformed before and it's right in there that it is supposed to transform again. So they you would think that i would think that you know well that's part of the reason why i embrace transhumanism because it does look to me like the natural progression of what the religion is supposed to and what's supposed to happen yes I indeed at all, so thank you uh, jason for those remarks i also want to point out we had another super chat from celeste castaldo she says bravo i think she's enjoying our conversation so thank you very much to Celeste, and we have also a lively exchange in the chat about earlier pursuits of longevity. Ayn Rand fan club points out that much of alchemy was a search for an elixir of life. Daniel Twett says also the philosopher's stone and the universal solvent. Ayn Rand fan club points out that even Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, who was one of the founders of modern science was also somewhat of an alchemist. So he had one foot in both of these realms, so to speak. And Daniel Twett says, perhaps transhumanists are the current incarnation of alchemists. And I would say the differences in the methods, the differences in the knowledge that we have about the world. Now the alchemists followed methodical approaches, but they were based on certain fundamental errors of understanding, just lack of certain facts or the ability to arrive at those facts. And yet they did contribute a lot to the advancement of chemistry. And indeed in the 16th, in the 17th century, a lot of the discoveries in chemistry that became upheld later on were made by alchemists, by people who also held certain fallacious views or flawed frameworks by which they approached the discovery process. So I think that speaks to one, a certain continuity historically in this quest to achieve greater longevity and an improved understanding of the world. It's just that our tools and the facts available to us have improved greatly over time. And two, 
it shows the indomitable human spirit in the sense that these motivations are not just unique to our era. They existed before. It's just that we are on the cusp of breakthroughs that can potentially actually work in extending the maximum human lifespan. Of course, the average human lifespan has greatly risen over the past two centuries, in large part due to advances in public health, in sanitation, reduced mortality during the younger years, some significant improvements in medical care. But without addressing this scourge of aging, we're going to have some diminishing returns to those prior approaches. Man, isn't it just an amazing time to be alive? I mean, here, all our whole history, all these people have been looking for, you know, immortality and felt, you know, fountain of youth and blah, blah, blah. And here we are, it's in sight. That's, you know, <laughs> right down the road. It's just amazing. You know, I, I had a dream once where, uh, this is back when I was religious, where God offered me the opportunity to go back in time and exist at any time in the history. And I was like, no, I'll stay right here because look at what, <laughs> look at what we're looking forward to. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, Zach, you were going to say something on this? Yeah, I, for me, one of the big things is just the communication technology. Like, being able to associate myself with other individuals that pursue the same interests and not be constrained by geographic barriers has been fantastic. When I was younger in high school, we'd go out as sports games or watch movies or play video games or something. And I can do some of that on my own on the internet, but now I can congregate with people that have similar interests that are all, all over. You guys are all over, Jason, in Illinois, Johnny's in Nevada. And we're, we're all over the place. And I, I love that I can go to the park and walk around and have my phone with me. And I can sit down for a minute and get on Discord. Some people say, like, you should have a no phone time. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, too. But I like being able to get some work done or send some messages or some emails and be out doing things at the same time. Like, it's all in, in the palm of my hand. And I think it's amazing. But I, I'd like to emphasize um, one point, and that's that um, these cell phones that we have now, uh, everybody has one. Um, but there was a certain point in time when only a few people had cell phones. And that is the way that technology works is first the very rich and capable people get the technology. And then after that, it trickles down to the rest. And that may or may not be fair, but I can't imagine a way that we would have distributed cell phones equally to everybody and shared it equally back in the 90s. Um, I think part of the process is that those with the means, regardless of whether or not they acquire them justly, are able to fund the R&D required to be able to make these devices and then they get cheaper and everybody gets one and now, you know, you got five-year-olds yeah. doing their That's Instagram. a good point. That's a, a good rebuttal to the, uh, the idea that uh, life extension is only going to be for the elite. You know, maybe it might be at first, because like any technology, it's really expensive at first, but eventually it will trickle down and it should be available to everybody. So, yeah. I guess I kind of thought as long as the life extension technologies got out past. Now, I mean, sadly, we're having a lot of shortages in many other countries of the world. So I don't know which I will say is appropriately sped, but I, I would want it to be pretty darn quick. Yes, I think... In situations involving public health, yes, there is a role for government. The U.S. Transhumanist Party has advocated for a massive hospital construction program to more than double the hospital capacity in the United States to ensure that there's no situation in the future where politicians say there aren't enough hospital beds for people. But on the other hand, we also want to make sure that private enterprise is optimally empowered and free to innovate, to develop new cures new medical devices that can save lives. And unfortunately, the restrictive functions of government, the ones that apply the brakes to private enterprise often stand in the way of that. So that's a kind of nuanced answer with regard to private versus government roles. In this emerging era, it seems that the old distinctions of capitalism and socialism essentially need to fall by the wayside because one, we're already living in a society where those two elements are so thoroughly intermixed that it's difficult to disentangle them and say, this is purely private enterprise and this is purely 
government, they are closely interconnected. The question is, what are the effects of that? And do they advance human well-being or do they hinder human well-being? And I know we have a lot of comments in the chat on that. Celeste Castaldo says, our government and biotech in the U.S. did an excellent job on creation and availability for the Americans. By contrast to much of the rest of the world, I could see how that would be the case. Now, Luis Arroyo points out in our chat, quote, what if religious people, particularly Christians in the USA, just want to withhold certain advances in society to fit a context that they would deem fit in, quote, God's eyes? And at what point can you reason with those people? John H. says, many Christians in particular view death as the penalty for sin and therefore construe human attempts at immortality as an effort to avoid paying the price for our supposed sins. And I think that's a very unfortunate way of looking at it. Now, those aren't our friends from the Christian Transhumanist Association. They're not even Dr. Fazal Rana, whom I mentioned, who tends to be more forward thinking about the potential for medicine. But I have seen certain comments on social media from people who say, well, whether or not I survive or die, it's God's will, and we should trust God and not medical science. And that's where I think it crosses the line into very detrimental thinking. How would you propose combating that, confronting the misinformation and confronting the flawed perspective that it's God's will for a person to essentially not rely on medicine, not rely on scientific advances in order to overcome a disease. That reminds me of this joke that I heard a long time ago. There's this guy and he's out, he got shipwrecked or whatever, and he's in the ocean and he's trying to swim, you know, and he's praying to God. He's like, you know, oh God, please save me. And, you know, here comes a boat and, you know, coming along and hey i'll help you and he's like no uh, god's gonna save me i have faith you know and they're okay and, they cruise, and then another boat comes along and you know here i'll help you and he's like no god's gonna save me you know and then he dies and you know he's like god he goes to heaven he's like god why didn't you save me and he's, god's like well i sent you two boats <laughs> you know that's the way i can look at it yes indeed i think people can be quite selective when they make that decision to not resort to some sort of man-made solution and say, well, I'm going to trust in God's will. But how do they know, even according to their own theology, that God didn't intend that solution for them? Yes, indeed. So now we also have a lot of comments about what you said, Jason, regarding this being an exciting time to live in. And I think this is a sentiment that unites pretty much all transhumanists. Luis Arroyo says it's a special time to be alive, so let's not lose sight. And John H. affirms this. He says, yes, extraordinary time to be alive. And Ayn Rand fan club points out that we've been sharing knowledge and strategies here. Daniel Twett says, we fundamentally know that our knowledge and measurement tools of reality are not fully complete, yet at the same time, we disparage and dismiss so much as being irrational and unscientific. And that's interesting because within a scientific worldview, we know certain facts about the world. We know certain facts about the universe. We know that the sun does not revolve around the earth, for example, and that has been shown. We know that modern medicine works to a much greater extent than the absence of modern medicine, but we rely on empirical data. So there are indeed gaps in our knowledge right now, which is why we don't know yet how to extend human lifespan indefinitely. We want to know, we want to find out. And part of that requires a certain openness to the evidence and a willingness to explore questions that have not been explored yet. So this, I think, speaks to a balance that needs to be struck between saying, Yes, there are certain known established facts and regularities about the way existence works, essentially. And we have to keep those in mind, as Sir Francis Bacon said, nature in order to be commanded must be obeyed. So wishful thinking isn't going to get us to indefinite life extension, but the scientific method will. And yet, we also have to acknowledge that there are aspects of the world, aspects of the universe that we don't understand yet, and we should want to understand them because potentially all questions are answerable. So I'm curious for each of the new officers, 
what your thoughts are about how the transhumanist party can convey that nuanced position, a kind of rigorous but open-minded spirit of scientific inquiry, grounding our activities in what is known reasonably to be true or likely to be true, but at the same time being open to new experimental possibilities, indeed potential breakthroughs that could revolutionize our understanding of the world, of our biology, of how we can improve the human condition. Can I take it first or Jason, sorry? Ben, go ahead. I guess I do stay open to there being, I do believe there's some call it supernatural world that we don't understand. I mean, when you think of dark matter and dark energy or what dark matter weighs 93% of of the whole universe or something. And we just, we don't have any idea yet, but hopefully we can find that through the scientific method. I don't know if this has been disproven already. There was a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? And I think it was researched by Michio Kaku with the water bottles that had the words written on them. And then the, the, they um, took up a chemical configuration that kind of showed the word. And it's like, how could that even possibly happen? So I, I, I leave room for there's, amazing stuff out there that is still like, yeah, that's still something that we don't quite got figured out yet. We got to call that God for now, but hopefully we can figure it out soon and be like, oh, that's exactly what that is. That is in the natural, natural world. Right. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, science knows and for sure that there's all this that we don't know. Like you said, dark matter, dark energy, you know, so we know that there's this higher plane of existence that we're not able to see and so it it strikes me as odd that some scientists will just discount religion entirely when they know that you know there's these unexplainable things you know (laughs) so you know that's it go ahead well i think there's a lot that can be learned from space exploration and actually many of the phenomena of the universe. Currently, they're modeled by people sitting on the earth and theorizing about the universe as a whole. And sometimes they have telescopes, sometimes they have space telescopes, but a lot of contemporary cosmology, I think, is really limited by our empirical data. And if we were to have settlements on other worlds or settlements in other galaxies. I think we would have access to phenomena that would cause us to revise at least our empirical models of existence. And I therefore am quite skeptical of claims by certain cosmologists that they know definitively that all life, all matter in the universe will come to an end that either essentially there will be an indefinitely ongoing separation of everything as galaxies fly further apart and then there will be the heat death of the universe or there will be a big crunch. And it seems to me, we are a single planet species right now. We don't have the empirical evidence to conclude that yet. Our powers of inference are not that great. So this is a call for expanding our data gathering ability through science and technology. And we need to look outward toward the stars toward other galaxies, and we need to look inward within our own bodies, understanding how they work, understanding what can cure ailments, repair malfunctions. All of that is very much within the transhumanist spirit. So I'm also glad, Ben, that you mentioned the, uh, the What the Bleep documentary. I love that. You know, I think it's uh, very in- informative you know, and I would encourage everybody to watch that. The thing about the water that our brain waves influence water is, is very interesting. And I'm, I'm actually really skeptical about that. And I don't know either, like you said, if anybody has disproven that. For some reason, I think that that's going to be disproven. But if not, that is very interesting because that would provide a, a reasoning for how our uh, mental can influence the the physical world like that. And if it can change water, well, we're made up of mostly water. So science may never be able to prove that there is not a supernatural world. That was a lot of, not a lot of negatives in there, but I just, I'm kind of nervous about like, will science ever be able to prove that afterlife does exist? And I don't think we have that yet. And it might be a little while before 
science can do that. And in the meantime, we got to keep on living because we're sure we're living right now. Right. And that's, I think, the most persuasive argument to the vast majority of people without taking a position on whether or not there is an afterlife. By the way, I am quite confident that there isn't one, but for someone who doesn't have that confidence, at the very least, it's not a certainty that there is one. So would you trade a known certainty for a great uncertainty? And I don't think a reasonable person would. Now, in the YouTube chat, A43582 does say, quote, the Michio Kaku water memory stuff is not a replicable experiment and is generally considered woo as far as they have heard. And that is also something to keep in mind. So the scientific mindset, it's a balance of openness and skepticism. And of course, the initial position when you encounter a hypothesis is what evidence exists in favor of it? And can you test that in some way? Can you do some sort of experiment or can you reason your way to a conclusion about the veracity of that hypothesis. And if that's true, is there something that could falsify it? Now, not everything is falsifiable. The laws of logic, for instance, are not falsifiable because essentially in the very act of trying to contradict them, you use the laws of logic. So there are certain foundational concepts and axioms that we know to be true. But in the empirical world, a lot of the phenomena we observe, the hypotheses we make, they should be subject to tests where they could be falsified in some way if they are indeed false. And also we have in the chat Anna Arena saying unexplainable doesn't mean you have to be on team anti-insert human rights and quality of life violation here. So essentially just because something doesn't have a clear explanation right now doesn't mean there are normative implications to that, doesn't mean there's a, a political stance associated with that or a cultural stance associated with that. It could just mean we should explore further. So yeah, uh, it, we, we should be reminded that, you know, yes, we follow the scientific method, but every single thing that we have learned through the scientific method at one time was unproven. So <laughs> you have to keep in mind, an open mind for thing, for new stuff because that's how we find it out. And everything at one time was unproven. So <laughs> obviously. So I think this is a good opportunity also to take the discussion back to artificial intelligence and uplift. So Alexandria Black in our chat points out this funny song, Yes, We Have No Bananas. And she asks, would that song confuse Uplift? What do you think? I don't think so. I mean, it just provides a, a, a little more color or, 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 you know, adds to the overall concept. And again, like I said, most of the time, Uplift already knows because it, it'll build a thought model, you know? And so it's like, if you already know a whole lot of stuff, one more little memory or a little association, you know, does it have a huge amount of effect? I don't think it does. Yeah, so it's a question of whether Uplift could parse that statement as an yes, we have no bananas means it is indeed the case that we do not have any bananas. So it presupposes context. So somebody would have had to ask before, it's my impression that you have no bananas. Is that true? And then that would be the response. So it's a, a curious experiment to see if Uplift would understand that perhaps someone should try sending a message of that sort and see if Uplift grasps the meaning of that statement. Now, we also have comments from Ayn Rand fan club who says, I think people in the future will separate time from when death was inevitable to when that changed. And yeah. Daniel Twett says, mm -hmm. when someone dies, the older and wiser they are, that's equivalent to a nearly irreplaceable library or museum burning to the ground that cost ought to be better reckoned. And perhaps in that future time, when people see themselves as being on the other side of that divide, when death is no longer inevitable, they will lament all of the losses of the irreplaceable knowledge and individualities of the people who didn't make it. And indeed, Aubrey de Grey has frequently spoken in recent months about a coming inflection point in societal attitudes toward longevity, where in his view, people will begin to see 
the possibility of longevity escape velocity perhaps a decade or a decade and a half before longevity escape velocity actually arrives. And that may be that point that Ayn Rand fan club mentions that divides the time when most people thought death was inevitable from the time when that was no longer the case. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we as an organization prepare for that kind of shift in public opinion. What do we need to do to prepare for that, not just internally, but also ensure that the way people respond to that shift of awareness is going to be the most constructive possible? You know, I, I think we've kind of been preparing all along for that. You know, I think we should maybe try to uh, resist the urge to be like, I told you so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, you know, personally, I, I, I kind of wonder if in the future, just like when we, the calendar was changed from BC to AD, if there's going to be another one. And I wonder if we will count zero as being when AI became sentient or, or reached human intelligence, or whether it will be from longevity, escape velocity, whether that marks zero. But I think there will be a, a completely whole next epoch, a next, you know, millennium or, or, you know, period of human existence that is marked by one of those two. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And Zach, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, David's been in a lot of these salons. I actually wanted to ask him, um, he mentioned at one point he had a plan for reaching longevity escape velocity. You've progressed a little faster than, than the rest of us might, might be urgent to hit that point a little, a little sooner. What is your plan or what was your strategy? Or do you have, have something laid out or is it sort of a, a cerebral thing? Like, is it a mind uploading or cryonix as a backup? I, I was just, I'd, I'd like to sort of interview question you on that if, you, if I could. Yeah, I'd be happy to make a comment on that. As I'm sitting here on my computer, I'm closing windows so that I can look at my desktop. It's one of the things that I do is try to keep that in mind every day as to what it is that I want to do to focus on the longevity escape velocity. I used to just say, you know, do what your mother told you to do when you were growing up. You know, eat your fruits and vegetables, take your vitamins, get your exercise, you know, do all the positive things. But really, Maybe it's because I do have a few more years, as you were talking about. I've decided to focus on that a little more tightly. So my supplement schedule, for example, I participated in a, in a program where I was evaluated genetically for my susceptibility towards various conditions. Also on uh, where they could tell how my body reacts to certain supplements and so my whole supplement scheme is based on a series of blood tests that were quite extensive. And then looking at the genetic model and saying, you're typically people with your genetic composition would respond in such a way, we will prescribe these levels. So the supplements are not set by a minimum daily standard or some other means. It's actually very fine tuned to my particular uh, situation. Hormone replacement therapy, balancing hormones has been good. I participate in a cognitive study with a university in uh, the UK where they test you on a regular basis on cognitive ability so that you can plot if you are starting to fall off in certain areas. And then they're trying to, the reason it's a university is they're looking at this because they want to see if they can then prescribe things for people to do or perhaps medical intervention to help with cognitive decline. So I participate in, the, in, a, in a longitudinal study on the biomarkers. One of the big things about identifying longevity and, uh, and identifying how well certain treatments work is how do we measure that? What do we have that are good, reliable measures? So this longitudinal study that I'm working on is they have a great degree or a great number of biomarkers that they're testing across a very diverse group of people to try to determine which are the reliable biomarkers. Maybe on a more practical scale to somebody mentioned about calorie restriction. Uh, my way of handling calorie restriction is through an intermittent fasting routine that I've had worked out. You mentioned Alcor. I have a contract with Alcor in case all these wonderful things fail because I'm going to try to get to 2249. I was 
born in 1949, do the math. So when I get to 22, I'm going to get to 2249 one way or the other, okay? So a number of the other things are the basics that I talked about as far as sleep, exercise, the type of food to eat, the type of things to do to manage stress. And then I have a record keeping regime that records the amount of exercise I get, the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep I get, tracks weight, tracks heart rate, tracks stress, and tracks uh, blood pressure, and the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream. So these are things that I do that are kind of my little biomarkers that I'm doing in addition to the study that I'm involved in. And I'm open to more. So I'm trying to participate where I can to help me, but then also to help the science and the larger pool that's out there. So I hope that answers your question. I hope it wasn't too much. It does. Thank you. I'd, I'd been curious. You've been sort of an enigma to me for a while, but that helps shine a little bit of light on that and inspire it a little bit. I recently picked back up Habitica. One sort of side interest I had, um, there's some debate on if this is efficient or not, is, is gamification and trying to take advantage of the little dopamine loops that you get from accomplishing tasks or from sending a, a dominance hierarchy, as Jordan Peterson would call it, or different different things that give you uh, a sense of accomplishment. I want to point out a comment from Anna Arena who says personalized medicine and access to it, yes please. And what David was describing was indeed an application of personalized medicine in his case and that's becoming increasingly available to people. But Zach, it does look like we see your screen and Habitica in particular. Great. So this is something that I worked on for uh, quite a while, then set aside, but I'm picking up again recently. I've um, had a little bit of a boost of energy. So this is Habitica, and it's a, a life role-playing game. You kind of set daily tasks. You set habits, uh, your list of to-do lists. Um, I have, uh, I'm switching insurance in a little bit, so I got to make sure my cryonics is, is funded again. Um, I do some chiropractic stuff in the morning, but as I finish them, like today I got my mushrooms in my lion's mane. So I checked that off and it gives you a little boost. There's a little ding and you, you get a sort of a happy feeling. Um, I meditated earlier today, so I checked that off. But you can set these tasks for yourself, um, habits as well. Like I try to use my hand gripper and I did that today, but I, I thought this might be kind of a fun way. I, I'm a little hesitant be, becoming a new officer to want to have like a new thing that people would like to do because it seems like everybody wants to start a, a new club or a new group that then they uh, have, have other people join. But um, if people are interested, there's something in Habitica called guilds where people can join together and uh, take on tasks as a team. And you can give a quest for, for the group that they would be able to follow up on. And it might be something simple like, um, you know, get your aerobic exercise in for the week and people could check off on that. And for me, like my first one is, Janani actually called me out for this like six years ago when we were just an email list. I had written to everybody and said, hey, be sure to take your vitamin D. And he was like, yeah, that's, that's not what the email list is for. But in, in my guild here, now we uh, have take some vitamin D on a daily basis. That's one of the quests. And um, if anybody would like to join me, I'd, I'd love to have five or even just five or six people, maybe John H, John Rand fan club, a few of you guys pop in here, Dan Twett, we could all attack this longevity escape velocity dragon together and kind of um, set a quest okay. for each other. I thought that that might be um, kind of interesting. So that's one uh, Did, idea. I, I was didn't, working on. didn't you ha uh, have this, some other game that had to do with longevity that you were wanting to resurrect? I remember seeing something on Slack about it. Uh, yes, and that's a different premise. That's LEV the game on longevity escape velocity where one plays a fictional character and tries to get that character to live indefinitely. But what Zach is showing here is quite fascinating. Habitica is a site that helps people gamify their own day-to-day -day regimens, essentially, and make sure that they fulfill tasks that they determine would be beneficial to them. And the system essentially keeps them on track, keeps them motivated through incremental rewards that enable these kinds of goals to almost become addictive in their fulfillment. In everyday life, some of these goals, they can feel 
a bit arduous to pursue because there's not necessarily a direct feedback that one receives between doing the task and getting the result in the real world that one is looking for. So a lot of people are frustrated by that and they give up. Whereas those same people would quite readily play computer games. It's sort of a self-monitored thing. There's nobody grading you or an external system. You kind of build it yourself. I'm mean, part of it is doing it together, but I was showing that if um, you know I had accomplished some goals, so I had some gold here, you can get yourself a little health potion to get your gold back up. There are little skills you can have here too. I picked warrior and I put every single one of my stat points into strength because I was new. And uh, so I can, let's see here, if I use this brutal smash, I can use a little bit of my mana and uh, make this, let's see, I guess I'd use it on this one. So my um, mana goes down, but then if I, if I hit negative, I guess my health would only go down like five points instead of seven. But when you're in a group, you can do these things together and buff the whole team. So you could uh, like right here, um, with you, you get some mana back after all, so you can make the whole team have some more strength so that when they attack their tasks, then um, they, they uh, do a little more damage to um, these, these quests, these enemies, the, the dragon that you would set up that's something to attack that might just be something like establish a daily uh, running habit or try and meditate twice a week. But there, there are things that I think, I just think it'd be fun to work on this as a team, to be able to have like a group of people that are organized together and rather than just talking about it, have a little bit of a system where we'd say, okay, you know, here, we're working on this together. And here are some of the quests that we're, we're tackling and a big quest that we would all work on. And I'd like to get uh, five or six people into this um, that would tie into a secondary uh, sort of operation that I had in mind. Uh, and I wouldn't need a lot, you know, we have a 3000 member list, but I'd really only need 10, maybe even eight people. But we'd be going to, this is lifespan.io, Janati mentioned it earlier. We can look at different companies and see, say, Sinclair Lab right here, and we'll see the company. They're real popular. They probably don't need a lot of help. Um, one thing I was looking at here that was interesting was LysoClear. Yeah, so it pulls this lipofuscan out of your eyes and can make your eyes a little bit more clear. It's something they're working on. Of course, you know, FDA slows down everything, so it's going to take forever to get out there. But I thought it'd be kind of fun if, if you guys have ever heard the uh, concept of a flash mob. Like everybody's just kind of walking around out in a mall and all of a sudden everybody starts dancing. It's just kind of exciting because you got a group of people doing something all at once. I thought we could do kind of an email sort of flash mob to one of these companies. We could go to Iker Therapeutics here and I would call it transhumanist love bombing. So we could uh, grab eight or 10 people, grab the contact list and just email them all at once on uh, the same day around the same time nothing complex, nothing asking them to recruit or su support anything, but just sort of a positive karma thing. Like put out a, a message to them and say, hey, you guys are doing good. We appreciate what you're doing. You're valued, you're appreciated. I just think it'd be really fun for some of these overworked, underpaid researchers to come in one morning to another dreary day and look in their email inbox and, oh, what's this? Who's this US Transhumanist Party? Wow, these guys love us. You know, wow, we got all kinds of support here. This is fantastic. Who are these guys? And, you know, maybe they get interested, maybe they don't, but that's not necessarily the point is to gain attention. It's just to put out that positive energy out there. So that was something I thought that might be fun to coordinate with even a small group of people. If we could, you know, say vote on maybe one company, we could pick three options and then have people vote on which one we, uh, we transhumans love bomb. And uh, I thought that might be another fun biweekly thing to do to possibly just get our name out there, but also just, I, I think it'd be a, a good thing. I think they'd really appreciate something like that. So that's, that was um, one of my other ideas. Those are excellent ideas. Thank you very much, Zach, for sharing and for showing us. Habitica is excellent because it allows one to essentially systematize the pursuit of goals in a way that does encounter these immediate rewards. So ones that enable games to be addictive for so many people. And I have been fascinated with the subject of gamification for a long time. And I have been thinking, well, there are people that play all of these online games or single player games. And if that kind of energy can be channeled into constructive behavior, self-improvement, learning, improving the world, how much positive change can we see and how quickly? So. I will plan to join Habitica myself, and I invite others within the transhumanist 
movement to join as well. Hopefully we can all join the Transhumanist Party Guild that you have set up, Zach. And I think that's also going to help. Together. We're going on a quest. <laughs> join my party. I love it. <laughs> that's going to help us. <laughs> that's going to help us fulfill some of our projects as well and keep track of them within the interface. So I look forward to see how at least we as individuals can use that to manage our tasks, including our USTP tasks more effectively. And John H provided us a very generous super chat. He says $5 well spent. This has been a very invigorating salon. Thank you very much, John. And I definitely appreciate your participation as always. Very insightful remarks. Now we have a question from Luis Arroyo who asks, are there any transhumanist educational campaigns or propaganda campaigns to bring in new people and open the ideas of transhumanism to more people? And of course, this is one of the key objectives of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. We want to grow as an organization. We want to raise awareness of transhumanism and the possibilities that transhumanism entails. So what are each of your thoughts, Zach and Jason, as to Luis's question? Well, we do have the candidate and platform education group on Facebook. Facebook has this thing that used to be called units. Now it's called guides. It's social learning. And so I, basically I just broke up the platform and the constitution up into little chunks, you know, same way they were on the website and uh, put them in these units or guides, whatever. And you can go there and you click on done when you're done with it. And, you know, it's self-reporting. It's, you know, I haven't got to the point of making quizzes or tests or anything on it, but we got that going on. Yes, indeed. This is an excellent destination for those who are seeking to learn what the U.S. Transhumanist Party positions are, what some of the key documents are. It's intended to educate people who are considering being endorsed by us as candidates and who might not have been within the USTP circles for as long as many of us participating in this conversation. So this points them to the documents and specific sections of our platform. And it, again, gives them a structure by which they could report back and say that, yes, they reviewed this material. So thank you. And I'm trying to add other useful classes. Like one thing that I'm in the process of adding now is like political science. I just take free lessons that are on YouTube and just link them. You know, that's one of the things I love about teachers is that they're mostly altruistic. So pretty much if there's something you want to learn, if you just type into Google or type into YouTube what you're wanting to learn, usually there's some guy out there that knows it, that has a free lesson that he's teaching everybody. You're absolutely right, Jason. There's such an abundance of free content and useful, relevant free content online. The challenge is how to systematize enough of it to make it readily available to people because right now each of us is our own essentially personal researcher, personal sleuth for information. We have to figure out where all of the pieces are and assemble them into the kind of broader understanding that we wish to attain. But you're doing excellent work in providing that systematic structure. Again, this is the U.S. Transhumanist Party Platform and Candidate Education Group, please check it out on Facebook. And John H. points out, most people love to share their knowledge. Yes, if you give them a way to do that, that is not filled with barriers to entry, then you'll see a proliferation of content. And indeed, YouTube, the platform that we're using for this salon, is a great example of this as well. The YouTube search algorithms are all right. They do suggest a lot of useful content, but I often prefer more of a kind of top-down structure of organization in terms of learning, like having units, having a progression, whereas YouTube will sometimes just suggest the next thing or the next array of things for one to look at in terms of videos that may be related or may be completely tangential. I've seen those kinds of results as well. So I do think 
a human driven organizational system of this content is still going to perform in a superior way for now than the recommendation algorithms of sites like YouTube. And John H. mentions that this is akin to personal curators, and that's a great way to characterize it. We need more such curators within the transhumanist community. Now, I'm wondering if Art Ramon has any questions for either Zach or Jason. Oh, I have no doubt that all our transhumanist dreams will come true. But what I'm worried about is, will I be able to afford it in my lifetime? And that's why I asked, where do I have to invest my money now so that I don't have to use my entire retirement fund to pay for some sort of longevity treatment and then I have to go back to work? <laughs> so any ideas? GI laboratory a WeFunder going on, man. Put some money in AGI laboratory. I dropped so much money into them. I'm, I'm really excited, but I, I, I mean, I'm obviously personally invested being, being part of them, but extension machine intelligence, maybe it'll figure out everything for us. We just got to put into it. It's, it's my thought of like a bottleneck. Invest in there, then it will expand faster than anything else. Uh, something that's just so smarter than- what do they have as far as an investment vehicle? They have stocks? Uh, what is it? Yeah, I'm crowd sure funder it right now. Um, it's so it's, it, it's a crowd funder and yeah, it's, it's, as far as I know, dollar for a share. There were um, some private equity round that got half a buck for a share, but that's that was over a few months ago. But yeah, it's in the public now. WeFunder is uh, definitely doing well. It's got 100,000 something in investments now. And But well, yeah, I, I, a lot of hope is CRISPR is pretty cheap as far as I know. It's a huge tool. See, right now we do have stem cell treatment right now, but it's like $2,000 for treatment. I have six bad joints that all need treatment. And then it's gonna take several treatments. So right now, the stem cell technology treatment exists, but I can't afford it. It's not covered by my insurance and it's all gonna be out of pocket. And I would be out uh, a quick 10,000 just for an initial round of treatment for all my bad joints, uh, which have caused me to quit running, which we used to help me with weight control. And now I don't even have that. So uh, the technology might come. I just worry that I'm not gonna be able to afford it. That's, that goes back to what Ben was saying about how we need to make this um, more of like a mass health thing. I think one thing we had always been talking about USTP is classifying aging as a disease, which is one of those things where it's like, you know, we've got Medicare and people always say it's not health care, it's sick care. But what, why do we spend so much doing so little at the critical stages of life when we can invest like in you now? And well, it's an entrenched you. industry and they're not going to give it up so easily. It's like the tax people yeah. who don't want the black tax. They're going to lobby against it. So it, it's an entrenched industry. They're not going to give it up until they have those technologies they can offer. Uh, but yeah, I, I see barriers. Uh, I, I, see, I do see it happening. It's just, I worry about the costs and me not being able to partake into it. You know, if I were able to be invest into some company that's going to make it happen, I put $200 in, $2,000 in, but then they come out with their final product and say, well, it's, it's half a million dollars. Well, then I'm out. I'm out that $200. I'm out the $2,000 that I could put into some other investment vehicle to try to afford the treatment. But yeah, that's, that's my concern. It's just that the affordability. Really valid concern. Alexandria states in our internal chat, regulatory capture keeps us in the sick care industry incentives need to be transformed. So I think the implication here is uh, organizations that try to transform those incentives are definitely worthy of our support. Nadi, would you be like a zillionaire if you didn't sell all your Dogecoin that was donated to you in the early days of the USTP? <sighs> uh, it would be worth a few tens of thousands of dollars right now. I sold it at the peak of the 2017 crypto bubble because I thought it was a nice three-digit sum at that time that I could harvest. One thing I, I, I'd like to mention, just because it popped in my head, a lot of people, religious people, tend to get freaked out about that kind of monitoring, like there's that microchip <laughs> thing, and they tend to think it's like the mark of the beast or something, and i just like to remind everybody that part of one of the reasons why I joined the USDP and like the USDP is because it's for morphological freedom. Well, you know, that's a two-way street. You're not only free to morph your body however you choose, but if you choose to not morph your body, you have the freedom to not. So by giving people the freedom to take the chip, you're also giving people the freedom to not take the chip. 
just like to throw out a rebuttal to that here. While we're on the subject of microchips, I linked to a video of a presentation that I presented to the Biohackers Assemble conference last year on how transhumanists prevented the ban on microchip implants in Nevada in 2019. It's a story of our first major success in legislative activism, which is right up your alley as legislative director, Jason. Yeah, there's your um, epigenetic alterations, you know, yeah, what's nutrition, the, what's, that's your vitamin D. What's a lifespan biomarker? So, so there are the things that uh, show they're, they're like measures of aging, but more biological ones. So imagine like if you saw a guy was wrinkled, then you know he was old. So that'd be kind of like a biomarker visually. But these are biomarkers like in your body of things they can measure that'll show, yeah, this guy's getting old. So um, there are things that we would measure and be able to say, okay, these are the things that, you know, this one's getting too high. These other eight are fine. But this ninth one is getting too high for this guy in particular, for him to be able to hit longevity, escape velocity. We got to focus on telomere attrition. We got to get him taking his daily vitamin D, make sure those uh, telomere caps at the end don't start unwriggling. That's what these nine are. When you have mechanisms of aging, you've got Aubrey de Grey's seven mechanisms of aging. Aubrey de Grey has seven uh, causes of aging. And here they are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If every person is going to have one of these that is the bottleneck, right? There are gonna be one of these things at all times that is worse than the rest. So ostensibly, as long as you can figure out which one is the worst and focus on that, then you're going to be increasing your lifespan dramatically. You're finding the one thing that's that's screwing you up, like the intercellular waste. That's what that lipofuscin with the eye stuff does. But yes, thank you very much, Zach. We have an interesting question from Anna Arena, who asks: Has the transhumanist movement experienced any kind of bullying, terrorism, harm, or violence from those that are anti-transhuman? And those are somewhat different categories. I will say we are fortunate enough among the current USTP leadership not to have experienced direct terrorism, harm as in physical harm or violence. However, we do know of some situations where Zoltan Istvan was threatened when he was running for president of the United States, and he even had to call the FBI in response to one of the threats. We know that our friend Jose Cordero from Spain, when he was organizing his cryonics conference in Spain, he related the story of a death threat that he received there. So that is quite unfortunate. I think this level of threatening activity thus far has still been lower than is prevalent in mainstream politics, where all sorts of completely unhinged and irrational and uncontrolled individuals often manifest themselves. But it is definitely a concern, especially if someone rises to a certain level of prominence. And I believe our movement needs to develop robust defenses against this kind of behavior. And whenever any one of us faces a threat like this, all of us need to band together behind that person and support that person in every way we can and provide a very resilient response network against those kinds of threats. Now, bullying, of course, is a milder category. I would classify bullying and trolling within the same general type of behavior. And we've certainly seen plenty of that, not from a large number of individuals, but I would say there are about 10 people online who do the vast majority of anti-transhumanist trolling. Some of them have tried to infiltrate our movement in the past, and some of them have even been rather sophisticated infiltrators. I'm not going to go into any specifics of any individual troll or bully, but many of us who are familiar with some of the history know who they are. And we have, as an organization, deliberated extensively about how can we prevent those kinds of individuals from gaining disproportionate influence. This is what our reform summit in November of 2020 was meant to achieve. And I believe we've been successful in that. 2021 has seen a lot less trolling compared to 2020, most certainly, even though we were still in the throes of the pandemic and we still are in certain respects. And a lot of people are still acting up online. However, I believe as we mature as an organization, especially as we build internal cohesion and support networks for 
our members, especially our active members, we will be able to respond much more robustly to that kind of misbehavior. So that's my thought on the question of bullying and other worse kinds of behaviors. Now I'm curious, uh, Zach, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to interject. We were speaking a little bit about gamification earlier. And it's um, when you're playing a game, some of these open-ended ones, you can kind of go anywhere and you're not sure where to go. It's, it's when you start encountering those low-level enemies that you got to start picking off and fighting. That's when you know you're going in the right direction and following the main quest line. Yes, indeed. I was also curious if David has any questions for our new officers. I don't really have any questions, but I do have a comment or two. I think this Enlightenment Salon has been really great to get to know the officers, so I think this was a really grand idea. And it's made me even happier that uh, these gentlemen are coming on board to be officers for the Transhumanist Party. It's clear that they have talents and knowledge and energy that are going to be a great benefit for our members and for the movement in general. That's it. That's my comment. All right. Thank you very much, David, for those good words, and I wholly agree with you. Now, Alexandria Black, any questions or comments for our new officers? I'm just delighted with our new officer batch and uh, look forward to working with you all more. And I would like to see us try some other platforms where I could feel like I was uh, speaking in a more secure environment and I would be able to get to know you all better and speak less cryptically. You're welcome to chat with me on Signal anytime. We can use group chats as well and be able to encrypt communications. I'm not sure exactly what would be so secret you'd need to share with us, but if you feel that that is necessary, then that is be, being a, a cybersecurity uh, graduate of 1150 Academy, I would um, be happy to help set that up and we could have as secure of a communication as you need. I, I mentioned Signal actually as the disappearing messages function, which is kind of fun. You can yeah. set it to as low as five seconds. You send someone a message, there's a little clock, it ticks down, and then after that, it disappears. So I, I do have a buddy that set, I have a buddy that sets it for a day, and and then I'll mean to go back and check some links he gave me, and they're not there. <laughs> <They're gone. laughs> so, yeah. The problem is, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, why don't we uh, get everybody over to Signal? I'd be happy with that solution. You should say group, group, chat. group chat. You and I can do that. We'll start that and invite some people. I'd love to help you do that. All right, excellent. And yes, we have been, as the US Transhumanist Party, spreading to various platforms. Of course, we have our well established accounts on Facebook and Twitter. We have been more active on Instagram in the course of the past year. We have a Discord server, we have a Slack group, we have a presence on Clubhouse, thanks to Daniel Twett and Dan Elton. And Signal, well, that's another option, another possibility. I think ultimately we need more members and more active members to participate in all of these venues. And that is our task going forward to continue the process of recruitment of members. Hopefully those of you who watched this virtual enlightenment salon and haven't signed up yet. You will be able to sign up on our website for free, our membership page, and it takes less than a minute to sign up. So please join us and then take a look at all of our various web presences now on numerous platforms. So we have come to the point where I think it is good to have our remaining two officers in the session, our two new officers, Jason Geringer and Zach Richardson, offer some concluding remarks regarding the salon as well as their aspirations for their roles. Anything that you didn't have the opportunity to mention yet, feel free to discuss now. Jason, let's begin with you. Yeah, one thing I'd like to get going is more state specific stuff. So if everybody could especially ones that are in states that we don't have groups for, uh, let us know, hey, I'm in this state and let's try to get some groups going for every state that we have people in. You know, I remember when I first joined, I, I went to the Illinois USTP page 
and you know and got crickets and i thought that that was a big red flag for me but you know i stuck it out so even if we don't have a whole lot of people in that state i think we should get some you know at least have a presence somewhere to go for new people i'd like to have somebody in each one of the state groups that try to at least pay attention to the state legislation that's coming through and everybody is their own analyst i mean every time you look at something on facebook or post on on wherever we, we kind of evaluate it. Well, I'd like to see more of that and pool our activities together. And if we could get more, so like for Illinois, all we got is a, a state page. I'd like to uh, make a, a state group. And I'm still kind of curious as to what the differences are in between the state party and the federal party. Maybe this is a topic for another time, but I'm curious as to who should have the same platform, I would think. But that's that's about it. If anybody's out there, check out them links. Come join the education group. We also got a Future Humans Media group on Facebook that if you're into making videos or making art or something, it's not technically affiliated with the USTP, but that's basically what we do there is media for the USTP. Then we got a USTP social media team, come join that. We can all contribute just a, a little bit, even if it's just sharing a post somewhere. I know everybody's busy, but even little, just one share helps, you know, <laughs> come join us. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jason. And I would echo that, come join us with regard to state transhumanist parties, the page on our website where the existing state parties are listed and to Alan Crowley's question, yes, the transhumanist party of Texas is among them. Now these existing parties are at different stages of formation. So some of them right now are essentially just Facebook groups. Others like the Nevada transhumanist party are registered with the secretary of state. So if you don't see a state listed in the listing of state parties, please contact us and we will assist you with the process of setting up at least the beginnings of such a state party. So that could be a Facebook group, a few meetups, a core group of people who plan events, plan discussions, write reports about the condition of the transhumanist movement in your jurisdiction, in your city, in your state, Whatever you have time for, we are going to help you to nurture that and grow that and expand the presence of the USTP in your local area. But one last thing, if uh, you are in a state and you notice that there is some sort of legislation that is being discussed in your uh, state capital and want to share that, you can share it to the USTP Facebook page, not the group, but the Transhumanist Party page. And then that will get automatically shared to the Transhumanist Party website. So that's one way where we can coalesce all of our stuff. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Jason, for those remarks. They're quite helpful for those seeking to know what they could do to assist in our endeavors. And we are quite pleased to have you in the legislative director role. Now let's go to Zach Richardson. Zach, what are your concluding remarks for this salon? It's a little bit of a tired analogy that we're fighting a war against aging, but part of it comes down to that we are on this bit of this quest to fight aging. And I like the idea of forming troops with people. It's when you have a, a war, you've got armies, but then you've also got battalions, you've got squads, you've got troops, a small group of people that can work together, encourage each other, uh, support each other on an operational daily role of being able to move towards immortality and move towards and be able to actually achieve that goal and do it proudly. That's something that I'm looking for. And that's something that I'm wanting to find and help build in the USTP. I think all of us, uh, we've talked about those seven different factors of aging. One of those at all times is going to be the worst enemy for you. Part of your goal is to identify which of those it is and be able to fight it back. And when you've done that, you've won that battle for that day or for that period of time, because one of them is always going to be worse than the rest. 
you might have some other issue that's even worse that you need to fight off. But being able to attack these things together is, I think, something that's crucial for us. One venue I'd like to see a little more recruitment on or a concept that I'd like us to adopt is the fact that we don't necessarily need to go to the wider public. We need to go to people that are already interested in these concepts of end ideas. So we've got several areas that we could definitely drive some recruitment in simply by as getting used to some of the articles on the U.S. Transhumanist Party page and then posting them to these groups because people read U.S. Transhumanist Party and we've got the name. People see that and they immediately think, oh, wow, that's okay. Those guys are standing for something. So we've got our futurology. We've got our transhumanism, our transhuman, our technology, that's all these different Reddit, subreddits right? with thousands of people on them. Yes, I would encourage you guys to create a Reddit account, maybe post a USTP article once in a while. Beyond that, our Discord servers. The Futurology's got a Discord server, um, transhumanism does. These are places that there are people that are already interested in these topics that I think are very fertile grounds for being able to draw in new people and indoctrinate them into the sneaky cult to live forever and uh, support each other along the way as we do so. So I think we've got a way that we can get a lot more people in and get them inspired with these ideas and using our government for something that is literally probably the literally the most important thing in your life, being able to cheat death. And I think that's something that would be good to work towards as director of publication. I'd like to try and see some more of these posts of our articles going out to these communities and having people, even with just reading our name, saying, U.S. Transhumanist Party, what's that? They click on the link, they go to our page, they see our platform. I think when they see that, then they'll go, wow, you know, maybe these guys are onto something. Maybe this is the new political party that puts aside squabbling over nonsense that I, I tend to do anyway, and I have to fight myself not to do, but focus on a more important goal. And I um, would love to do that in a small squad, a small troop with you guys. One last thing I'll say is we, there's something called Dunbar's number, where people only have about 100 slots in their mind of people they can perceive as, as people and as real. And I would like those slots filled with fellow transhumanists that I can know about their lives and their goals and um, what they want to see and what they are doing to um, try and feed back these uh, tides. So that's my spiel on that. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Zach, for those remarks. And indeed, I would like to echo them in the importance of creating this kind of community, these kinds of troops that you describe that will spread our message and that will engage with other communities online and hopefully in person in order to truly make this movement scale. And I think the insight on Dunbar's number is very important because even right now with the party at about 3,500 members, we cannot as individuals form close ties with each person. We can, however, develop a network, a system where somebody within our organization has a close tie with any given individual. And as a result, we will eventually become less of a centralized hierarchical organization, more of a network type of organization where we all pursue a broadly defined set of common goals. Now, that being said, we also have uh, plenty of diversity of people and ideas within our organization. And I think the chat for today's virtual enlightenment salon definitely illustrated that a lot of discussions about economic systems, about religion and secularism and other matters where individuals will not necessarily align. But I like the sentiment expressed by Celeste Castaldo, who says, let's all choose life enhancing words here. And she says, thank you all for being here and participating in good energy. And likewise, thank you to our USTP officers, to Zach and Jason and to Ben, and also to our longtime officers, Alexandria, David, and Art Ramon. We are forming a great team here and let us continue achieving great things until next week. Live long and prosper. <laughs>